Thank you for visiting with us today. I'm Michael Markowitz. I'm director of the Institute for Retired Professionals. We're really pleased to have you here at what is another page of a very rich uh, year for us in which we celebrate our origins at the New School 50 years ago. Our program is unique. It certainly was unique and innovative when the New School welcomed us. Uh, I, if you want more information, please leave your name at the uh, desk, and we will invite you to an information session to learn more about our program and see if it fits your intellectual needs at this time. I'm pleased to introduce the dean of the New School for, Social, for Public Engagement. He is known as a leader uh, in developing innovative programs to involve institutions of higher education. He is the founder and director of the University of Chicago Arts of Citizen program, which seeks to integrate, to integrate civic engagement and the liberal arts. David's own scholarship explores politics, culture, and space in, in 19th century America. He taught for 16 years at the University of Michigan. He holds a PhD in American studies from Yale, where he also received his BA, and an, a diploma in social anthropology from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. I'm very pleased to, to introduce the dean, who has become a good friend of ours and who will introduce our guest speaker, who it will introduce us to more of the talent and the interests of the community that we are part of. David Scobie. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I'm all of those things, and I thank him for the, for the kind introduction. For those of you who are here for the 50th anniversary celebration, I announced then that I hoped to be soon a member of the Institute for Retired Professionals. Uh, and we were just talking about making sure that uh, that, that process uh, happens. I, it's great to see everyone again. I, I, I recognize many, many voices and faces, and um, uh, I'm delighted to be continuing to celebrate and support uh, the IRP. I want to begin, before I go on to a note of pride in introducing my colleague, Robin Hayes, I want to begin with two quick notes of, of regret. The first one is um, this morning, uh, an emergency meeting got scheduled for me for 1.15. So I'm going to have to do the dean thing, which is to uh, introduce a fabulous colleague whom I wish I could hear and then skip out. Uh, and the second thing is it just started doing construction noise in the back. When I, on my way out, I'll see what I can do about that. But I, I apologize if that keeps coming and going throughout the talk. Um, but more importantly, um, Robin Hayes, the, the new school, as all of you know, and it's why you're here, is, is known and it's part of our DNA that we're both wonderfully interdisciplinary and passionately committed to social engagement and social justice. And I can't think of any colleague who more embodies both of those qualities and the intersection of those qualities uh, than Robin. She is a scholar and filmmaker who is an, ex uh, an expert in African American studies and political science. She got her degree from Yale University with a combined doctorate uh, in those fields. But she's a member of our management and international affairs and I think media studies uh, faculty. She, she is wide ranging uh, and intellectually engaged in, uh, and curious. Um, she uh, is among other things a, uh, a, both a writer and a filmmaker. Um, she is finishing a book manuscript and a related documentary film entitled African Liberation, Black Power and a Diasporic Underground a project supported by the Ford Foundation and, and, and uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities and, and other funders. She's wonderfully interesting uh, to hear from, and I know you will enjoy it. And today, I believe she's, uh, she will tell you something about a really amazing documentary film project about, about black revolutionary Cuba. 
So Robin, my apologies for having to skip out. Hi everyone, how's everyone doing? Thank you so much for taking the time to come out today. I know it's damp, it's the holiday season, and um, it can be hard to find the time, so I really appreciate your being here. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit to introduce uh, the film, and then we're going to have movie time, which is always fun. Um, the project that I'm working on right now is called Black in Cuba, and it follows a diverse group of students at Yale University who feel like outcasts at the elite institution, and they band together and adventure to Cuba to see if revolution is truly possible. So, um, I don't know, is that Mitt Romney? I don't know what. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, so that is the project, it's something um, so at this point, we have what you're going to see today is a rough cut of the film. Um, it's about 80 minutes long, and we have been doing work in progress screening since May um, to get a sense of uh, how the film responds to the needs and concerns of the people that we want to reach with the project. So um, we know a lot of people here have lived this history, have been working on issues related to social justice. Um, and so we definitely want to hear from you in terms of your impression of the project, what we might want to do differently, what more information you'd like, or just, you know, do you like what you see? So we'll have a little bit of a, sur a brief survey um, we'd like you to complete, if you don't mind, after, after the film is done. Um, so the film is part of, um, is a production of an organization I'm working with called Progressive Pupil. And uh, we make Black Studies for Everybody by creating and sharing a documentary film and digital media. So um, as you can see, I don't know how many people Facebook. I'm going to show of hands. Do people, nobody? It's OK if you don't. <laughs> you probably get outside and have lunch and socialize in healthier ways. <laughs> so that's OK. But if you do, you can find us at, on Facebook at Black and Cuba or at Progressive Pupil. And if you tweet, you can find us um, at P Pupil on Twitter. And then also, if you like to read blogs, we have a blog. Uh, it's called Progressive Pupil at insetwordpress.com. So we do all of this because we um, want to serve uh, artists, teachers, uh, students who are uh, working against racism, both in the United States and abroad. And we think that black studies is something that can be not just on campus, even though it's important to have it on campus, but can, it can be a part of our work in an everyday way. Um, so that is um, our, our mission, our objective, and it's what we hope to accomplish with Black in Cuba. So if there aren't any, aren't any other questions, let's get started with the show. We, thank you. Thank you. So uh, Vaden, who uh, works with this progressive pupil, uh, she is going, you might recognize her as the Vaden, who really radicalized her father. She's all grown up now. So she is uh, passing out the contact sheets and also the surveys. Um, but while, so if you can take a moment and just fill those out, if you'd like to keep in touch with us um, on our mailing list, we snail mail and email. Um, and also, uh, there will be surveys uh, for your feedback. So if you don't mind just taking a few moments and letting us know what you think. Um, and we are learning a lot from the work in progress screenings that we've done. We've already done one follow-up interview with um, a representative from Amnesty International based on the feedback. Um, and so we, we really learn a lot and we really appreciate it. And if you need pens too, she has pens. So let's get started with the, the question and answer while people are, are finishing up their surveys. Please wait for, um, so we can have a, a complete video for folks who weren't able to make it. Please wait for the, uh, the folks with the mics to come over when you raise your hand. Yes. Hi. I found your film really informative, and I'm really glad I came today. So I have a question that I don't know if you can comment on. Sure. Was there ever a period of time in the, in the years after the revolution that things were better there without discrimination and racism that you concluded with that just feels disheartening. Mm -hmm. Well, from the research that we've done and the comments we heard while we were in Cuba, the discrimination never disappeared, right? So there has always been this issue of sort of uh, a ceiling of um, 
promotion in terms of the highest levels of the Communist Party there, um, that there had been um, still a lot of social prejudice and stereotypes that existed. But as we note in the film, the uh, socialist reforms did accomplish things that we're concerned about in the United States in terms of narrowing the achievement gap, um, the racial achievement gap in education, in terms of democratizing access to home ownership, um, in decreasing joblessness. These are things that um, the revolution was able to achieve in terms of, of race relations. Um, but there was never a time when there was no discrimination. And scholars have observed that the increase in capitalism in Cuba has also um, it seemed to t seems to have turned back the clock in terms of the progress that um, those reforms were able to accomplish. So the increased capital, uh, the increased competition for private financial resources has um, made it more difficult for Afro-Cubans to gain certain kinds of employment in the tourist industry. Um, it's created more racial tensions on the ground. Um, and that was something that actually, especially among young people, there had been observations that that was kind of going away. Um, so that seems to be, in terms of answering your question, after the revolution there was never a racial utopia, um, even though Cuba claimed that they had achieved this colorblind society. That doesn't seem to be completely true, but there were things that they did that seemed to have addressed the problem in, in significant ways. Please wait for that. Please wait for the mic. I, I just came back from Cuba, so this was very timely for me to see. I was there during Sandy. Mm -hmm. And I watched with deep sadness in my heart all the scenes filmed in Santiago, which was the area that was hit very much by Sandy. Um, I thought Cuba was amazing. And I'd like to know what, you, what your feeling is about the pluses or minuses of the United States lifting the embargo. Um. Just pluses and minuses. I mean, I think uh, it's clear that the embargo is a violation of human rights, and human rights advocates agree. Um, it's a violation of the, um, the principle of sovereignty, which is guaranteed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, it also restricts our capabilities to travel, as you, know, you guys know who are, are traveling to Cuba. Those of you who are going to Cuba in January. Um, it, so in terms of a plus or minus, the plus is that you know, it's one of the longest standing um, sort of transnational violations of human rights, and lifting the embargo would end that. Um, I think uh, among Cuban solidarity activists here in the States, there also is a concern that given Cuba's financial vulnerability now, lifting the embargo will open the door to the kind of exploitation that we see in other Caribbean countries that are dominated by foreign investment. Um, so that is a possible minus from their point of view. But I think as citizens, in my personal opinion, as citizens, I think we have a, a strong responsibility to support the lifting of the embargo, um, just because it violates our freedoms, it narrows our freedoms, and it narrows the freedoms of Cuba in, in, in unfair ways and has for many decades now. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, wait, wait for the microphone, sorry. <laughs> yes? <laughs> I know when you do a documentary, you have a point of view. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning about your point of view. Mm -hmm. um, was that the reason why there were no white activists really taken in with this study? Because I don't know very much about the black study programs, but I mm -hmm. noticed that um, there were many white activists and many white people were left out of that. Is that because? Mm -hmm. This is solely from a black point of view, mm -hmm. or were there so few activists that they couldn't even be shown? Well, I think we certainly didn't make an effort to I exclude anyone based on their race. Our group was our group. And um, uh, the majority of graduate students in African American studies, not just in, at Yale, but in general, are Afri of African descent. Um, in terms of the film, uh, we really were driven by the information that was required, we felt, given our story and the story of the trip. So um, the, the white people who are there are there for a reason. Um, 
it, we haven't excluded or included anyone specifically based on race, but really more uh, the film is meant to be um, an explanation of a history of struggle against racism and the majority of people who have been involved in that struggle. Not all of the people who have been involved in that struggle, but a lot of people who have been at the forefront of that struggle are indeed black. Uh, yeah, um, I'm sorry. I, this this film has set me has set my blood pressure sky high. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe some of my thoughts did not come come out quite coherently. Mm -hmm. um, so this is more of a comment rather than a question. Sure. Uh, I think this is lopsided, one-sided. It is magical thinking. I I think it does a disservice. Um, I don't know where you are going to be showing this, mm -hmm. under what rubric you are going to be showing this, who has funded it, but I, I trust it will be massively reworked or perhaps just discarded. I, I think it is, there are so many omissions. There is so much that, that is left unsaid. This is, this is totally biased. Mm -hmm. And I, while there are some things certainly, I think many of us in this room might support, aspects of the revolution, mm -hmm. aspects of, uh, of racial struggle. I think this truly does a disservice, mm -hmm. in my opinion. You know, Can uh, you, uh, just to help us in terms of it is a work in progress, and we, we really, it's important for us to hear this kind of feedback. Can we you hear give me a sense of, of what you would like to see in the film that's not discussed? I, 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 no, I would suggest throw it out. Throw it out and begin again. Throw it out and begin again and have, we saw archival footage. We did not see, I, I'm in the stu Cuba study group, even though I'm not going to Cuba, I would like to go to Cuba. Mm -hmm. um, we had a Skype uh, presentation a few weeks ago with a woman from Berlin who works with CUNY and brings um, graduate students there. Mm -hmm. And she is very familiar with the, this, the um, Cuba as it is today. Mm -hmm. And she does, she's very balanced. She does not pull any punches. She is supportive where it's necessary. And she's critical where it's necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, so I couldn't even begin to tell you where I think you, should, you, you, you could do a better thing. I think these students who went, what revolution did they see? Mm -hmm. what, did, what were they prepared to see? They were prepared to see what they wanted to see. They mm -hmm. certainly didn't, pre they weren't, who were they speaking with? I mean, there was, I would love to know what their itinerary was. I would love to know who the people they were introduced or they were allowed to speak with were. Mm -hmm. We heard nothing about, about oh, now this practice has changed. It certainly, I'm, I'm sure, has changed. We have heard nothing. I was amazed to see at the bottom, at the end, you had LGBTQ and mm -hmm. blah, blah. We heard absolutely nothing, not that it had to be that at all. Mm -hmm. Nothing about the prisons which were filled with LGBTQ people, with the prisons that were filled with a political dissidents. We heard nothing about that. Absolutely mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, I'm absolutely, I'm shocked. I, you know, I, I, excuse me, I, I'll, I'll leave it at that because, mm -hmm. but, you know, um, uh, I, um, at least, at, at least you got me, you got me thinking, uh, not thinking, no, you know, no, I'm sorry, you got me reacting because I, I don't think this really makes, has made me think, it's made me react um, and think only in the sense that it's unfair. It is biased. It is. Well, please, if you can think after you know your reactions have died down and you feel that there are some more concrete things, like you just mentioned some examples of what you feel should be in the film and would make it less mm -hmm. lopsided, mm -hmm. please do email us at progressivepeople at beautifulnews.com. Do you know Fresse Chocolate? Yes, movie? I've seen that. Mm -hmm. OK, OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, let's, let's move on. But please, please do send us an email if you have some more. Yes. Uh, yes. And then her in the front. Hi. Um, I'm not missing this side of the too. I'm having a, a very different reaction to seeing the film, mm -hmm. um, and I am all a flutter and um, having I don't know just a really strong reaction. My family, um, my dad's family, is black and Jamaican, um, black Cuban mm -hmm. and Jamaican, and this film meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me to see this, um, and it really resonated with what I've heard. <laughs> from my family and, and community. Um, and so while I know that other perspectives are important, I, just, I also wanted to really share that with you, that I find a lot inspiring about this, and it makes me want to take my own journey. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Phil. You have a lovely green sweater. You had your hand up, and then we'll go to this side. Here. 
the Cuban Revolution was certainly. I don't know what's going on, did you? Is it on? Yes. Okay. Was certainly. A, Can you check her microphone and see if it's if it's on? It, it is on. Just don't hold it here and just speak closer to it. Okay. Okay. This Cuban Revolution was certainly an inspiration to all countries in terms of its standing up against U.S. power mm -hmm. and creating its own model. Uh, to me, I, it should have taken up the extent to which uh, the leaders of that revolution took the Soviet model mm -hmm. uh, and other liberation movements too. And that model did extinguish in creation of a new man, I suppose, and that was a mythology, a new human being, the socialist man, eradicated individualism, took books out of the library, put people in prisons, and that part was never taken up. I'm not talking so much about the faults of it, but the mm -hmm. way in which mm -hmm. that revolution was impacted mm -hmm. by having followed the yeah. Soviet model. And that um, is actually something we're planning to address in a, in, a future, um, in a future draft of the film, and we're doing some research now, about um, freedom of speech both in the United States and in Cuba and how that has played out in terms of the anti-racist struggle on both sides. So that is, is an, a question we are going to investigate. Mm -hmm. You uh, said before that with the advent of capitalism and the ability to uh, acquire things that only capitalism provides, mm -hmm. that it actually hindered and hurt the, the evolution of freedom and act, uh, religious equality in Cuba. What specifically has happened that make you say that? Mm -hmm. Well, the schol sorry, scholars have observed that um, since the openness, um, economic, the economic openness, that um, there have been a few things that have happened. One, there's been an influx of money, of, of US dollars and in capital investment from the Cuban American exile community here in the United States, 97% of which is white. So it creates um, a capital, a, a, an imbalance in terms of access to funds that disproportionately um, benefits white people in Cuba. Um, sex, so there's more money for them to start small businesses. It's hard currency that many Afro-Cubans don't have access to. Um, secondly, the dependence, a lot of the capital reforms have really focused around the tourist industry. And the tourist industry is dependent on European investment primarily. Um, and those European managers um, tend to favor lighter skinned and white Cubans in the higher paying tourist jobs. Um, so as we saw in the film, you know, when it's the people serving, the people in the resort who are working, most of them are lighter skinned Cubans and we know most people in Cuba don't look like that. Um, so those are some concrete ways that the capitalist reforms have sort of created an advantage, a racial advantage for whites. Um, and in that sense, um, have scaled back some of the gains that the socialist reforms had made in terms of racial equality. And the Cuban government hasn't done anything to rectify that? Doesn't seem, it's certainly, according to the uh, scholars that we have talked to whose work we've, we've researched, they haven't addressed it um, concretely. Hopefully they will. Hopefully they will, but it, it hasn't been addressed. Two more questions. So you said focus on these two on this side? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, um, just counterpoint, I thought this was amazing. It's amazing. I'm looking at the file footage, and to have Julius Nairi, and in the late 50s, early 60s, these key African leaders who were wiped out, but they brought so much promise to the world when they first came and you saw Patrice Lumumba, but Julius Nairi, uh, Tom and Boyer, these kind of folk, and to see you had file footage of Robert Williams, who we know Martin Luther King, but folk don't know Robert Williams and Negroes with guns, and the fact that we did fight against the oppression. So I'm just amazed by that. Thank you. Uh, I'm also uh, positive, positively impacted by seeing 
those young students that you had speaking being the talking heads because, uh, you know, as an older fellow, I'm seeing our youth generation being caught up in all the bling and the, and the glam that, you, that we see in the, uh, the uh, MTV ads. Um, I'm, I'm, I was saying earlier when I came in, I was a, a teenager, I was like 12 or 13, when Castro came to Harlem. He, had, he was in the Midtown Hotel, and they said he was, quote, cooking in his hotel room and, and uh, 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 chickens. And the real deal, he was practicing his religion. And he left there and came up to Black Harlem. And again, my two friends seeing this on television, we walked to 125th Street, and I'm just putting this social history out there. And white students had come up from downtown, and they were out there, and they're going, Castro is a communist, Castro is a communist. And that was the chant. And of course, we joined in. Castro is a communist. Castro is a communist. Uh, and there was a, a black man sitting on a wooden stool, a, a, a wooden horse, and he says, young brothers, come here. He says, do you know in Cuba the revolution is going against discrimination? And, you know, of course, the discrimination that was going on in America was all in, in the papers. And he says, and this was my life lesson. He says, never follow the crowd. Do your research and then take whatever position you want to, but never follow the crowd. And my question in terms of, of the film is, and I, and I loved it, but what was lacking for me was the political oversight or overview or focus in that Castro has outlasted all of US presidents from Eisenhower to Barack Obama. And the constant barrage against Cuba for all of that time continues. It started then and continues now. And the difference is, and a young lady asked about, uh, mentioned the uh, Soviet model. The Soviet Union, when it was dismantled, now there's no longer the economic source and the, and the uh, military might to defend Cuba. But in spite of all of that, they're sending doctors or sending doctors around the world to Africa, mm -hmm. to Latin America, mm -hmm. and they have this uh, um, medical program. So it's, it's those kinds of things are not lauded enough, I think, you know, in, in the film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I, I salute you. Thank I you. I really, really do. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a, a specific criticism and then, and then another comment. The criticism is I find it very difficult to believe that of the teenagers that you asked that all of the white children did not know anything about Cuba or about Castro or I mean after all they're at least wearing Che Guevara shirts and that there was a, a a bias that began the, the film. Just for clarification, you mean in the very beginning? In the very beginning. You set up mm -hmm. a false paradigm right there. Those, and just just in, in our defense, that footage is at Williams College, where I taught for a year, which is the number one liberal arts college. And it was interviews by a, one of my students who was white, um, actually two of them. One held the camera, the other person did the interviews. And they were talking to their friends. Well, I, I taught junior high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not have had one student, black, white, Hispanic, mm -hmm. or Asian, who did not know those people. Now, I realize it's the city of New York and that we are cosmopolitan, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, you chose to put that in the film, and mm -hmm. it sets up a, uh, a bias from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So that then you come to Harlem and you choose to ask, uh, someone wearing a Black Panther button, you choose to ask someone who is a member of the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. you choose to ask political people who happen to be black. Mm -hmm. And of course they have answers. So mm -hmm. I think that, that you have set up something from the beginning mm -hmm. that makes someone, uh, like some people in this audience, a little angry. Mm -hmm. And part of that, having been very sympathetic to the Cuban Revolution, mm -hmm. and having followed it as long as this gentleman has, and remembering the Hotel mm -hmm. Teresa, and all of that, I say, gee, you didn't. You had these Yale kids. I, I give them a lot of credit. I hope that when you make a film in 10 years, they are doing some socially 
productive things, but I'm not sure they will be. But I hope they are. Mm -hmm. And uh, you didn't have anything in the film about one of the great progresses that continues in Cuba about women, mm. whether of any race. So, mm -hmm. so I think that you've set up, as you redo the film, mm -hmm. kind of say, hey, who's my audience? Mm -hmm. If it's people like me, you mm -hmm. lost me. Mm -hmm. If it's another group of people, maybe that works. Mm -hmm. I just want to also clarify, and I, I appreciate your comments, especially the comment about women and, and Carlos Yoga, who's in it, we talked to in the film on a couple of occasions. He talks about how part, he believes part of the progress that Cuba made around feminism was because it, those issues were, uh, women and, and people who were concerned about those issues were able to talk about it openly. And, they, and it wasn't an openness about talking about race in the same time, and so he talks about that. Um, but I also want to make it clear, in the beginning of the film, um, only one student really knows nothing, right? The other students are sort of like, eh. No, they, and, it's not so. I mean, really, please check your film. I, I mean, I, I've, I've seen it a few I know, times, I and I, I, they, I, I think that, I think that, I don't think it's fair to say, I mean, because we, could, we have had these conversations, I've had these conversations with my editor, we could have edited to make them seem you know, much more sort of clueless, but what they're really reflecting is the ambivalence that mainstream culture in America shows towards this problem. And it's an ambivalence about the embargo, about the lack of normalization of relations that I think Cubans cannot afford to have. At Williams College, the overwhelming majority of students are white. Yeah. Well, I, I hear your comments, and we, we unfortunately are out of time. I really appreciate everyone coming, and I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.